thanks a bunch. So what is heroism? Heroism is fundamentally about risk. The very word implies risk. And Mike just took a big risk today, talking about something in his personal identity, his personal life, to say what he's about. We encounter risk in our daily lives. And I just want to compliment Mike for taking a risk here today to say something that was important to him. It's scary to do that. And I want to impress upon you that real heroism requires risk-taking. Heroism equals risk. This morning, we heard about the risks that whistleblowers take. They risk their careers. They risk their families. They risk their social relationships in order to stand up for principles that they believe in, things that they think are worth more than a carefully guided career that's taken decades to build. That's risk. Social heroes risk things. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. risked angering millions of Americans with a set of very controversial ideas that he wanted to put forward, that he thought we needed to have to advance as a country. He also took risks in his personal life. He pushed his friends and family. He pushed his closest allies further than they were comfortable going to advance these ideas. And if I can get this to advance, you know the consequences. That's a child looking at a father in that casket. Heroism requires risk. Make no bones about it. Every day, our men and women in uniform go across the sea to fight wars for us. I don't care if you agree with them or disagree with them. The war. Don't disagree with the war fighter. They're taking risks on your behalf daily. Not all of them are heroes. I work with U.S. military veterans every day of my life. They will tell you, I go across the sea to do my job. I'm not a hero. I just do whatever it is that I'm doing. Even hardened combat veterans will tell you, I wasn't a hero. But some go above and beyond the call of duty. And here I'm not talking about the call of duty in a video game. I'm talking about the call of duty in real life. They go above and beyond. And you know these stories. You know these stories in your bones. They're the stories of soldiers who cross a battlefield under intense fire to reach out to a soldier who's wounded themselves being wounded grievously multiple times in the process. That's heroism. That's what wins the Medal of Honor. And I want to point out, the cool-looking dude in the video game is pretty huge. He's got a nice 9mm pistol. He's got a very sharp knife. He's dressed in all black. He's huge. This guy's not big. This guy's not that tall. He's not that physically robust. He got out there and he did his job. He took the risks that needed to be taken, and he earned the Medal of Honor. And some of you in this audience will go on to military service, and I want you to rem remember that, okay? Your country's behind you. We understand the risks you're taking. So I want to touch for a moment on what is crisis. The technical definition of a crisis is a situation that goes beyond our current understanding and our current ability to respond to it. On September 11th, you know what happened. This changed my entire career. I became a U.S. Department of Homeland Security fellow for three years as a result. I've spent my entire career studying crisis, studying major disaster. So from 9-11, Fukushima. Think about it. Japanese and international responders donning protective gear. Just clothes, really, special clothes. Walking, one by one, not away from, 
but toward a nuclear reactor. To say it's more important that I risk my life, that I face something that every human is terribly afraid of, radiation. Because if I don't do this, radiation is going to spread throughout the country that I love. It's going to th spread throughout the Japanese countryside. First responders went into that nuclear reactor to try to shut it down. The same thing happened at Chernobyl. There's a monument to some of the folks who died in Chernobyl as a result. I bet you don't know about it. Take a look on the internet. Right now, today, in Africa, the Ebola crisis is spinning out of control. There are medical personnel, doctors, nurses, mortuary workers from all over the world, including the United States, being deployed as we speak into one of the biggest medical crises we have ever faced. What do they have on? Some protective gear that might work, maybe. They all know that a percentage of them, that protective gear isn't going to be enough. They're going to get it. They're going to get the virus. What's the death rate from that virus? 50%, 80%, 90%? A percentage of them are going to die. A big percentage. So the point that I want to make to you is there's a technical definition of crisis, but crises are the situations that forge heroes. And we need a great deal more research. I'm a clinical psychologist. I do research in social psychology. We need a great deal more research to understand how it is that heroes can stand their ground in crisis situations. We don't know much about it. We really don't. And for some of you, you're thinking, I'm going to go to college. I'm in high school now. I'm in undergrad. I'm thinking about what I want to do for graduate school. Go into education. Go into psychology. Go into leadership. Go into military studies. Go into diplomacy. And help us answer this question. We need you. We need your smarts. So I'm going to ask the question again, what is heroism? Heroism is fundamentally controversial. So I'm going to tell you a whimsical story about a captain, and then I'll tell you a more serious story that we heard a little bit about yesterday. So Chase was here from uh, Deep Space Nine yesterday and part of today. She's an actress on the show. I am from the generation that watched The Next Generation, so I'm going to have to hearken back to um, Captain Picard. Sorry. So in this episode, in the second season of Star Trek The Next Generation, an episode called Where Silence Has Lease, the starship enters sort of a space vortex, and they're attacked by a space being. They can't get out of this vortex. They're even attacked by an apparition of their own vessel. And they try to get out, and they, they just end up right back where they started. And Captain Picard and his first officer realize that the only way that they can get out of this situation is either to break free or to destroy the vessel. And so they set the auto-destruct timer for 20 minutes. And they try desperately to negotiate for their release, not knowing what's going to happen. And the counter is running down. Five minutes, one minute, 30 seconds, 20 seconds. And as the audience were becoming increasingly aware that they have indeed broken free, that they're safe. But the captain doesn't know that. And the camera pans across the bridge officers. And you see terror in every one of their faces. You see that they silently disagree with the captain's willingness to risk it all. They're thinking that maybe there's another way out. But the captain is unmoved. He wants to know that the greater risk has passed. And not until that does he cease the auto-destruct. So, of course, this is for dramatic effect. But there are plenty of examples in real life where the equivalent of the auto-destruct timer runs down to zero. And we heard about that yesterday with Flight 93. I guarantee you that not everybody on that airplane agreed with the decision. There were women and children on that airplane. There were families. 
there were men who probably thought, you know what, let's keep going and see what happens. There were some people there that realized that the threat was too great, that they couldn't allow this situation to continue, that they needed to act now. And so in some research that Dr. Phil Zimbardo and I did, this is in a publication called The Review of General Psychology in 2011, we surveyed over 1,000 people and we asked them about different heroic situations and we asked them to rate them. And one of the things that we found is that a psychology term called justified risk, yeah, I can see that somebody would take that risk. That makes sense. That's an okay level of risk to take. That is not as associated with what people think about as heroism, as unjustified risk. Unjustified risk is taking a risk that goes beyond what's normally acceptable. And we've been hearing about that a lot over the last day and a half. Heroism takes you outside of what's socially acceptable, right? You start to stand apart from, and that's a scary place to be. Mike just did that a few minutes ago. He said, this is something about my identity that I'm a little bit scared to say because I'm not sure how people are going to react. He did it anyway, and that's powerful. That is heroism. It's a small version of this bigger stuff, the more dramatic stuff. Those are the small steps that lead us to be prepared to answer existential crises. And I want to ask the question, what if we fail to act heroically? And I want to impress on you that failure to act heroically is costly. We heard about another ship captain yesterday, the captain of the Costa Concordia. He was negligent in running the ship onto the rocks and causing this accident. But it was a failure of heroic leadership that led to 32 lives being lost after the ship crashed during a leaderless, botched evacuation. And Matt Langdon and I, Matt is the host of our conference, wrote a piece in Greater Good magazine called The Captain Who Fell Into the Lifeboat. Instead of honoring the law of the sea, that requires the captain to stay aboard until the last person has been able to get off. And if you're interested, take a look on uh, Greater Good's website. It's greatergood.berkeley.edu. You can search for it and find it there. In this particular case, the failure to act heroically, the failure of heroic leadership cost the shipping company and the insurers over a billion dollars. So if you don't think heroism is important to the corporate world, you better think again. And I think the reason that we're all here today, ultimately, is because we think intrinsically that there's something about us that can be heroic. And I agree with you. Dr. Phil Zimbardo agrees with you. We called it in an article again in Greater Good Magazine called The Banality of Heroism, the idea of the everyday hero. And I believe that everyone can be a hero. But I want to impress upon you that that does not mean that everybody will be a hero. Because we're afraid. We're afraid to lose our job. We're afraid to ruffle feathers. We're afraid of embarrassment. I want to also convey that it is not about trying to do something dramatic, trying to get on to the 10 o'clock news. It's about taking the next right action and focusing on that, not the overly dramatic. You all can be heroes in waiting. What does the H in heroism stand for? It stands for hard. Heroism is never easy. We have examples from history. I regret that I have but one life to give for my country. Remember the Alamo, Flight 93. And what I want to tell you, is focus, focus on taking the next right action, even if you're not sure what the outcome will be, and let history sort out the rest. Thank you very much. The Hero Roundtables are the global events that ask the question, what is a hero? You've just seen one hero talk. To find more and join the conversation, visit our website or social media.